Welcome to the Story Powers podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Brian Miller. Brian is a former magician turned author, speaker, coach, and consultant on human connection. His TEDx talk, How to Magically Connect with Anyone, has been viewed over 3 million times worldwide. His book, Three New People, has been recommended by Publishers Weekly, Seth Golden, and now by me. Just in case Seth wasn't enough for you. If you like the show, please subscribe and leave us an iTunes review. I know that remembering to do that is harder than solving a Rubik's Cube or pulling a rabbit out of the hat, but as Brian here would tell you, there's a lot of magic in just asking. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Miller. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Francisco. It's really nice to be here. That was that was <laughs> that was a lovely. I like that you threw in that that your recommendation was was added in in, in addition to stats. I'll take it. I'll take any person's recommendation. Uh, thank you for for buying and reading the book. I really appreciate that. And and I I say that because one of the reasons why I said that is because you did something I hadn't done in my book, and then I copied your idea, which was at the end of the book you thanked people for list for reading and asked them you know please write a review, which is which is pretty obvious. And it was I I had published my book earlier this year, and I thought oh that sounds like a genius idea, <laughs> so I went and did the same thing. So I had that sort of fresh in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, that's so funny. You, it it is amazing how you know how simply asking, you know, genuinely asking someone, um, not at the beginning of your relationship, not not meeting a stranger. It's not like on LinkedIn when you get the cold message from someone you've never met, and you can ju- you just know as soon as you hit that accept request button, the next thing is a copy paste pitch that's coming in. I'm just like, I want to keep believing in humanity. So I hit the accept button. And the next thing that comes in is a copy paste pitch. I'm like, ah, no, don't do it that way. But someone's already invested in your work. They got to the end of the book. If they're at the end of the book, they liked it. Otherwise, they would have abandoned ship. That's the right time to ask. No, that is true. And there is true. And talking about the book, I'm not sure if I should thank you or curse you for this because it seems like you magically implanted a word in my head and now it keeps coming back often which is sonder Mm, what a great word do do you mind just explaining what that word is sure of course so sonder i i wish it's a word i had invented i didn't it started making the rounds on the internet you know probably a good seven eight years ago um it's become a little bit more common now uh, in in normal non-pandemic times when i was speaking uh you know and if with a live audience of 100 200 people if i'd say uh hey who's actually heard this word and put my hand up two years ago no hands would go up but now half the room will put their hand up so it's getting around sonder is the feeling that it's this momentary feeling that when you see another person stranger or not a stranger that you realize that they've got an entire life of their own that you know nothing about right that they have hopes and dreams worries and concerns just as real just as vivid as yours, and yet you have no access to that emotional data. It's, and, and the first time, you, you know what that feels like, too. As soon as I describe it, everyone's like, oh, yeah, I've had that moment where you go, wow, that's like a, a person with a whole set of experiences and life and stuff, and they're walking around just like I'm walking around with that noise in the back of your head all day, every day. And I think the recognition of that internal life in every single person you meet and interact with it once you realize that you 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 can't treat people transactionally anymore it's really hard to keep living like that i think i had relationships like that yeah (laughs) absolutely i'm sure so did i yeah yeah it's not yeah then it's just one of those ideas that it, it it's so poignant when you when you consider it really and it's perhaps one of those things that it's difficult to think about too much because it could again i think it it can motivate you to behave towards people in a different way as you propose in your book but it can also be somewhat paralyzing at times because it's just the wealth of human interaction and joy you could be experienced but but will but won't realistically because there's just not enough time um you know that that one that one clearly stuck with me <laughs> yeah that's that's interesting you know there's there's two sides to everything obviously and uh and some some folks um i think probably the only real criticism of my book and i, and I don't think it's really a criticism but some people have you know read it and said you know 
God, if I actually lived, really lived according to the philosophy in this book, it would be crushing. It would be too much. And I think maybe, but maybe not. It's just, you've never lived like that, right? It's just a different attitude. It's a different way of being, a, a way of, of, you know, essentially the philosophy in, in the book, Three New People is, is that you want to live your life with a recognition that every single person you meet and interact with is worthwhile, that every interaction is meaningful. Every person you meet is important. Um, and actually, there's so much of the book that come, that that in the back of my head, I don't think I ever referenced Doctor Who in the book, but I'm a huge lifelong Doctor Who nerd, ridiculous Whovian. And there's this one episode of New Who where um, w- the doctor's companion or guest in the episode, you know, basically said, but like, why me? I'm not important. And the doctor said, you know, in, in whatever he said, in, in a thousand years, 2000 years of time and space, I've never met anyone who wasn't important. And that's the point. You didn't mention Dr. Who, I don't think you did mention that you could tell many talk about many things in regards to Batman and Superman. <laughs> and, you, and you never did. Now, I actually just had a, a uh, recorded an episode with someone who I didn't have to dig around a great deal to find out that he was also a nerd. And it, it t- threw the conversation completely off track because we spent most of it talking about Batman and Wolverine. So I'm not going to make the same mistake here. No. But but one thing I wanted to tell you is that there is an added layer of pressure in in doing this uh, this interview with you. But one, because my wife likes your TEDx, so she's <laughs> looking forward to how this one turns out. But also because you talk in the book about all the crap interviews that you've given. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to put some questions together. I was like, no, no, I'm sure he's been asked this before. I can't uh, ask this. <laughs> well, uh, here, here's what I'll say to that. You know, y- you, you're not the first person I've ever, uh, ever since I've, I've publicly said stuff like that in my book and in other things that people say, I'm a little nervous because you've talked about interviewers. No, it's like, and the point is, if you had that thought, like I'm a little nervous because I want, that's it. You did 99% of the work already. The recognition of this is a person and not just someone they're not, this is not just a person that I can transactionally use to serve my podcast. This is a real person that I'm having a real conversation with that which is like a life philosophy, not just in interviews. That's enough. It's, I remember Malcolm Gladwell talking about the number one predictor of parents beca- that they're going to be good parents is not, <laughs> it's not what you'd think. It's that they'd purchased a single book on parenting. Not that they've read it, even if they've never read it. The fact that they went out of their way, put their money down and bought a book on parenting means they're going to be good parents statistically, because they've already put in the effort to want to be good parents. And so the fact that you even thought to yourself, well, you know, I want to make sure that's you did the work, right? But let me get some learning out of that. So in in your view, what makes a, a, a bad or a good interview, or for that matter, a good or bad conversation? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great question. I like that you you distinguish between those two, because it's not necessarily that a great interview needs to feel like a great conversation. They are two different things, right? Conversations are, they don't have the same goal. An interview has a goal. You have an audience that's going to be hearing this at the other end of it. And so you're trying to serve what we're doing in the moment, but you're also trying to serve the future audience. And so you do have to play a different game here, right? Like what we're doing right now is not the way we'd be having a conversation if we were just sitting in a coffee shop and and chatting, right? Because there's a bit of call and response here and you're trying to navigate in your head you know, you want to ask a question that I would be interested in, but also one that the audience would be interested in hearing. You want to ask about stuff that you care about, but also not only stuff you care about, but also stuff your audience is going to care about and stuff I'm interested in talking about. There's this crazy amount. Interviewing is really hard. I run my own podcast. It is so much harder to be a host than to be a guest, in my opinion. Um, It's really hard. So the, what are the, the, what makes a good interview? Let's, let's start there. I think what makes a good interview is by and large that you are present with your guest, that what happens a lot with interviewers is they think, well, I've got to get in the answers to all these questions. And so they ask the first question and then I'll give you an answer. Maybe I'll tell you a story that's really meaningful to me and I'll really bear it out there for you. And then the interviewer will go, 
fantastic. And then they'll just look down at their paper and read the next question. And it's like, did you even listen to anything I just, how could you hear the story I just told you and not have a follow-up question about that? So I think a great interviewer needs to be willing to abandon their script to serve the moment. But at the same time, you need to be willing to steer the conversation if the guest is running off on something that's not relevant to what your audience eventually is going to to be interested in, right? You need to be able to steer it back. Uh, Cal Fussman is one of the great interviewers of our day and uh, listening to him is a masterclass. So that that's those are some of the things that I think interviews. Conversations are a whole other ballgame. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> Let me share with you something I lived through for many years. And I think you appreciate this perhaps more than, than the average person. When I got into sales many years ago, I had this great manager who, among many things, trained very well. And he really believed that rapport, or building rapport, was something you could teach. Because I ever, almost everyone we had had in the company at the time said, no, no, either you can build rapport, you can't build rapport, you can't teach it. And he says, no, 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 100% you can teach it. Mm -hmm. And this is the exercise he had us do for a long time. And then I had to do it with my team for years, at least once or twice a week. Someone would ask an open question, whatever, whoever's running the exercise would respond. And the next person in line had to ask another open question that followed logically from the first one. And then you just kept going round the room until you know, made a mistake, you're out. Mm -hmm. And then you kept going. And I, I remember in the beginning, it was painful. No one could, you know, it was like, so how long have you been in Connecticut? I've been here for five years. Oh, and um, and what do you work with? No, 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 mm -hmm. five years. So where were they? Where were you before? How do you find it? What's your favorite part of it? And, and after a while, everyone could do it. You could keep going. It's like, okay, guys, fine. We've done half an hour. Right, we need to move on to the other <laughs> job. But, but, but it was incredible how much you picked up on. Okay, there's a clue here. There's a clue that that's not ans that there is an answer there that I don't know. I should ask. And and most people have are not terribly good at that. So th that's that is such a good point. And I, and I know I said this all throughout the book, and I say this in all of my engagements. I I, I this is one of my the things I need to beat into everybody's heads when I'm teaching this stuff is there's this people have this idea that connection is somehow a gift and not a skill. It is not a gift. It is a skill. There's not a baby born ever who knows how to do what we're doing right now, right? Who knows how to make a meaningful connection with a stranger, with another human. It's, it's not what you're born with. There's no one knows that they can't even talk, right? So the point is you can learn all of these things as a skill. And when you recognize it's a skill, you can practice it. You can hone it. You can make mistakes. You can learn from your mistakes. You can get better and you can do it in every single conversation. And so one of the uh, one of the things that you were just talking about with uh, the ability to ask a really good follow up question, right? This is a really hard thing to do. It's simple, but it's not easy. And one of the uh, examples I think I gave in the book, I never really know where I've written this stuff. It might have been in one of my resources on my website, my ebooks or something. But um, one of the examples I give is if if you're having that, you know, that really boring conversation with a stranger where you're, you're you know, maybe you just jumped into a cab with and you got someone else and they go, ah, the weather, right? You know, that thing, that just white noise we say to each other all day that every day that doesn't mean anything. They go, ah, the weather, right? Instead of going, yeah, and that's it. It's over. You could say, oh, interesting. Uh, what weather do you prefer? And they go, oh, I, I like, because you'd be surprised. Not everybody likes it when it's sunny. Some people like it when it's raining. Some people will say, oh, I, I, I prefer, I really like snow. Oh, why? What about snow? Um, what do you like? They might say, well, I, you know, when I grew up in wherever I was, and now, oh, boom, you're having a conversation. You're, you're really meeting someone now. And it's amazing how quickly the right follow-up question can move you from strangers and superficial to meaningful connection. Meaningful connection doesn't mean you have to spend three hours talking to every person. You can have a meaningful connection in eight seconds with, you know, the the person, you know, when you're in line for coffee, that's that's taking your order. Even just to say they, they go to take your order and you can give them your order. And while they're ringing it up in that eight seconds, you can say, hey, it's pretty busy in here today. How's how how's it been? And sometimes you ju they'll just go, oh, yeah, it's been really busy today. But thanks for asking. And. That's it. That recognition of another human as an individual with value and not just the person between you and coffee, that's enough sometimes. I guess that for a lot of people, 
as you said before, you know, there's there's someone told you that it would be uh, heartbreaking to live like that, where you're meeting all these people and you're having all these experiences, and and it is true that a lot of people haven't lived that way. Now, I, I perhaps I'm slightly more familiar with that feeling because I'm not from Barcelona. I mm -hmm. lived most of my life in Brazil, then I lived in London for five years, then Madrid, then now here. So I've been out of Brazil now for almost 18 years. And that, you know, not necessarily to the extent where you're meeting three new people every every day, but there are so many people that you know are going to be transient in your life. Mm -hmm. You know that their destiny, or at least their intended destiny, is not to stay in whatever place you are now because they're passing through as most people are passing through. And I guess it's it's like this myth that people that love is this finite quantity. That, you know, you have one child and I could never love anything ever. No, then I have the second and then you love the second as well. You don't spend it, but at the same time, you don't, it doesn't finish. But at the same time, it is true that you do have more opportunity for missing people. Um, but, you know, you take you take the good with the less good. You, you know, it's it's that's a it's a really good point about the scarcity mindset. I mean, it's not you know connection is not finite. It's like you said. I people have this idea like, well, if I if I give connection to th you know two people or three people, I'll be out of it. No, no, you can you can just keep giving it right. Like connection is a gift. That's the that's the the beauty of being in a world where what Seth would say, where most of our work is done in emotional labor, right? I'm not, I'm guessing you're not, you know, working, you know, working with our hands and, and building things. Now there are people who are doing that. And I, 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 God bless those people. Cause I, I've never done anything like that in my life, which is an incredibly pri privileged thing to say. Right. But more and more people, especially as automation and robotics take over a lot of that kind of work, more and more people over the next 10, 20 years will be working exclusively in emotional labor. And once you're in emotional labor, you can just keep giving like you can you can give connection over and over and over again and it doesn't have to drain you it drains you when you're not good at it right it drains you when like you said the first time you did that exercise and you try to think of a follow-up question and you can literally get entirely emotionally drained in three seconds because you can't think of the right follow-up question but as you get good at this it just becomes natural and then you actually start gaining energy from being able to give that gift of connection it's amazing and it's probably similar or not too dissimilar to to creativity for example i don't know i is you you relate to this before you write a book it's the most daunting thing you've ever done and it is i remember the first few pages were horrendous i, I thought but i'm i'm a decent writer i've been writing speeches for years uh, why can i not write this three four five intro pages but then this magical thing happens is that halfway through, it starts getting easier. And at some point, it's like, okay, I need to figure out a way to stop because otherwise I could write this and make it into the new War and Peace. Not all of this is going to be good, obviously. Like War and Peace wasn't very good for most of it. <laughs> but the more content you produce in a way, the more content you can produce because perhaps the muscle has just been trained. And, and I can imagine that connection would be like that is just something you do yeah it is it, it's it, it, that's, that's so funny about writing a book it was so daunting and i gotta tell you having written one it's still daunting there is something about writing a book because i've been i i was working on my second the follow-up before we went into pandemic and spent as i'm sure you did as a speaker spent most of the last three months abandoning any long-term projects in favor of anything that would help short term rebuild my career for the virtual world. Now that I've spent three months rebuilding and I'm good now virtually, I can get back to the long term projects like a book. But starting the second book, it was funny because I had that same daunting feeling. I was like, how am I going to do this? And I was like, no, you did it. You already proved to yourself you could do it. You just have to you just have to be willing to slog through the difficult beginning part, right? Or the difficult middle, like, it's like, mo I think most people love having written a book. Very few people love writing a book. <laughs> I don't, I think even really good writers. <laughs> there is that, there is that 
a line from Tim Urban, who has a very popular TEDx talk, and I love it. He says, I always love the idea of having done a TEDx, a TED talk. <laughs> right. right. Oh, yeah. The, the, the TEDx was, I mean, that exactly. What a great, great example. That was easily the most difficult single project I've ever done in my life. Spending three years writing a book was easier than the three months leading up to TEDx. I mean, that was because of the because of the 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 pressure that's put on that platform to this once in a lifetime moment opportunity and i got lucky too because i i gave mine right before tedx got a little oversaturated a little watered down i gave it at a time when it was still possible to go viral um i i think it's it's <sighs> You, you can do a really good TEDx talk that, that gets a lot of views now, but the idea of just popping the way mine did, it's hard when there's like a thousand new TEDx talks published every day or whatever. Um, it was saturated when I gave it, but it was like the last opportunity and I, and I got very lucky with that. But the, the months leading up to that talk are, are crazy. And I've been asked so many times since, are you going to do another one? I'm like, no. No, right. they're like, you, what, what? You've yeah, done exactly. it. Done. <laughs> they're like, why wouldn't you do another one? I'm like, because it would never live up. To what end? To what end would I do? I've done that. I did the, th if the first time I gave one, it only got 200 views. I would have done another one and tried again. It got 3 million views. I, I, there's nothing I could ever do that. 3 would... million and 200,000 the last time I checked. <laughs> How lovely. How wonderful. <laughs> I mean, just 200,000 people extra have watched it. That's true. We don't, you know, it's funny because once, get... <laughs> once you get to millions, you do start rounding, but you do forget 200,000 people is a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> if I was giving a speech to 200,000 people, I wouldn't even know what was happening. Um, that which, you know what? This is so funny. I had no intention of talking about this, but that just steered me and it just made me think of something. So many people looking to write a blog, do a podcast, write a book, give a TEDx talk, they get hung up on that number. Some people go, my TEDx only got a thousand views. It failed. I'm like, if you were standing on a stage with a thousand people in the audience looking at you and giving you their undivided attention, you would take that very seriously. You could build a career for the rest of your life from one speech to a thousand people. So you really need to consider that the numbers, they really don't matter as much as you think. Like 3.2 3 million people have seen my TEDx. Almost none of them have paid me. Almost none of them have hired me, right? But I built a career for the rest of my life on the, in, like the 0.0001% of them that did reach out. So like, you don't need to worry about uh, the numbers. And I, I feel like, you know, you're starting, the, you know, you're, you launched a podcast just recently, right? It's really easy to go into the analytics and just keep going, oh, there's only 12 people listening, or maybe you have 1,200, or maybe you have 12,000. I don't know what you have. Everybody thinks their number's too low, though. Everybody. Everybody, I you go into the podcasting forums, and, and there are people who are going, there's only 10 people listening to my podcast. What do I do? And the next post is there's only 10,000 people listening to my podcast. What do I do? It's like the numbers, they don't matter. The connection. Matters. I'm finding this an interesting thing with the podcast. And again, for you, perhaps it's different because yours started, you started the podcast quite a lot after you had already done the TEDx and, and, so, and most of the other stuff, right? So mine, I'm finding this very interesting thing, which is one, I enjoy it. I mean, this is very enjoyable. So if nothing else, I'm meeting a lot of people that either can teach me a lot or who are the people that are going to be my colleagues and maybe my mentors in, in, the, in this new industry. And that alone to me has value. Um, the second thing is, I mean, from a networking point of view, it's incredible <laughs> because you reach out to people who have no idea who you are. I mean, you said yourself before we started recording, I forgot to include the name of the podcast or a link to it. So you had no idea what this was and you still said yes. And, and this has been my experience that people want to have, people enjoy having this conversation. So they say yes to things that they wouldn't in other contexts. Um, you know, if I said, I would like to have a call and pick your brain for half an hour, you'd probably say no. I would have said but the, no. <laughs> yeah, but the podcast, it, for some reason, it, it it has this power. So, yes, I mean, I'd would, I would love to, you know, a few months down the line, have thousands of people listening to it. But if, you know, no more than a few hundred, which is more or less seems to be the case now, are listening to it and enjoying it, I'm getting so much out of it myself that it doesn't matter. And also... 
no one knows how many uh, downloads a podcast has. That's that's it. And there's something beautiful about podcasting, which is why it's catching on so much, is it's not just that the analytics are hidden. It's it's the fact that because the numbers are hidden, the potential listener isn't influenced by the numbers, right? When you go to YouTube and you search for something and you see a video has only got 15 views and the next one is 15,000, you're not going to watch the one with 15 views, even though it could be the best video ever made. It could be exactly what you're looking for. You're, you're never going to give it the time of day. But because you don't get influenced by seeing numbers or downloads or subscribers on a podcast, people are engaging with the ones that just seem like on their face something they might be interested in. And because it's a podcast, they'll give it 30 minutes or an hour before they make up their mind. Whereas a YouTube video, I'm giving it three seconds, right? I mean, if you're lucky, I'm giving you three seconds before I move on to the next one. So the beauty of a podcast for me is one, it's not influenced by the numbers. You get to really make a a difference. And two, it feels personal. You've got someone else's voice literally getting beamed into your ears, right? Right into your head. And because you don't see 15,000, a million people, that makes you feel like one of a massive group when you're on YouTube watching a video, right? Oh, I'm one of a, th- a, a thousand people, a million people who've watched this video. Podcast, it feels like the host is just doing it for me. It's just for me. It's right in my ears. It's very personal. It's very intimate. So you get to make a connection with the listeners in a such in such a deeper way than you do with... I don't know any other form of media. I, I, I have a book. I have a bl- I have a weekly blog. I have two YouTube channels. I run, you know, the podcast is so special for that reason. Something you said before that I think connects to this, this conversation we're having now is you were talking about how the interview is, you know, the interview is not a conversation. So there's a whole bunch of factors that go into that. But something I've been noticing myself and hearing from other people. So I was talking to to uh, Billy Samoa, who has a, a podcast called Insight Out, and he interviewed his dad, mm-hmm. right? So and he had a, a almost two hour long conversation with his father. And, and at the end of the podcast, both of them say that it was one of the most uh, interesting, meaningful conversations they had. And these are people who have a very good relationship. And what I was left thinking about after that was, yes, it's not a conversation, but isn't to in some ways what conversations could be but rarely are that that's that's yeah that's i hadn't conceived it like that so that's given me a lot to think about that's really interesting and i i wonder if that's because you're so aware of providing value to the potential listener when you're doing it this way that what you've got in the back of your head is yeah i want to have i want to talk to this person but i want to make sure everything i say Every question I ask, every point that I make has real value and isn't just filler, right? Because you've got that focus going on. Whereas in a normal conversation, you know, we might have filler moments. If we were sitting in a coffee shop, we'd both take our phones out at some point and then come back to the conversation or kind of drift off a little bit. And you could be like, "Uh, check out that hat that person's wearing, like stuff that just doesn't matter, right? But here we have to stay focused because it's not just for us, it's for other people value as well. Um, And I wonder if that level of focus is what makes, because I I agree, there are so many podcast conversations I've had that have been the best conversations I've ever had in my life. And some of them with people I've known for 10, 20 years, and and I've known really well. And then we'll have a podcast. It's just like you said, have a podcast conversation and go, I learned more about this person I've known for 20 years in one hour than I have in all the years I've known them talking to them. It's amazing. And what I thought about this was, yes, I think the focus to the audience is one of them because it forces you to have a better conversation. You you don't want to dominate the conversation. You want to pick up on things that the person has said that that should be followed. But I also think as well is this commitment that you just don't have in real life in saying, okay, Brian, you and I are going to sit down here and for, you know, 40 minutes to an hour, we are going to talk about these things that we know we we do and we know are important to each other but we never talk about it because we talk about you know we talk about sports or we talk about the news or we talk about nothing in particular over a drink which is what how most friends interact but i have friends that do very interesting things 
And I had never had a conversation with them about it. I have a friend who who I studied with and he later became a historian. So I interviewed him on the podcast about, you know, where storytelling meets history. Hmm. It was a great conversation. And I have another friend coming on to talk about how storytelling in advertising, which has been his career. I never talked to him about that. Like, never. Huh. Yeah, so, that that yeah, you're right. There's a there's kind of a contract and a commitment that comes with it. It's reminding me of something. Um, I had the career honor just recently of having Julian Treasure on my podcast, who is just you know a, a TED royalty, right? Um, like 80 million views. He's got one of the most popular TED talks ever, and proper TED, not TEDx, but proper. It's TED. how to talk so people would listen, or something. Exactly, like that, yeah. exactly. How to speak so people will listen, and um, yeah, exactly, and. So I got to sit down with Julian for an hour and I've been, I've worshiped this guy for so long and you have to put away that worship too, to have a real conversation. You can't fan over someone, right? As, and, I'm, as I'm doing right now, bro. <laughs> of course, of course. I can see it. I can see that you're melting. I'm um, one of the three million. I had, I have tattooed <laughs> here somewhere. <laughs> you're probably one of those 200,000 that I discounted a few minutes yes, ago. Yes, uh, <laughs> about that. <laughs> so he, he was, he and I were talking about having difficult conversations in your real life and, 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 and how to do that, especially if you're maybe an introvert that has a more difficult time saying to someone, you know, getting your word in or getting your, your point across. And he, he made this suggestion, which was one of my favorite suggestions. He said, you can ask somebody for five minutes of their time. You can say to someone who's, you, you can never get your word and you can't get your point across. You say, listen, there's something that I, it's really important to me that I can talk about with you. I just need five minutes of your time. Can I get five minutes of your time when it's convenient for you? And almost everybody says yes. How could you not say yes to five minutes? It's only five minutes. But he said, what you've got now is a contract. When you sit down to have that five minutes, they've agreed to five minutes and that's very reasonable. So you've got five minutes of their undivided attention that they've agreed to listen to you or have this conversation with you. And I think it, that's why it reminded me of what you were just saying is when you've got that commitment, like we've committed to an hour. It's like, I know we're talking for an hour. So if if I decide 20 minutes in that my head's not really here, it's going to be a long 40 minutes after that, right? Because I've already agreed to do it. So I may as well get invested. So I think there's really something to that. There is something that I've heard, I think it was from Sam Harris when he was talking about meditation. And he said that nothing is boring you're just not paying enough attention <laughs> that's such a good quote yeah yeah and, and, so good and i remember that uh, i think it might have been that same sales manager that had the, the interesting exercise where he would play as a, a an audio clip and he says okay listen to that okay fine uh now i want to play to you again and there's something you need to to get from that. There's something very important the person's going to say, and I need you to find out what it is and write it down. And the, before he plays, everybody leans in and kind of puts his, put their head down to listen with attention. And the three minutes just feel completely different than when you were. And when you just kind of, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, sounds interesting. It, it's just this commitment. You say, I will be, be present here. And then you have to pay attention and it changes your, your experience of what's going on. And this, this is why one of the fundamental techniques that I teach in my communication workshops for organizations and, and everything is reflective listening. This is another one of those. And this to you, this will be like, obviously, because like, you know, this world, but it, it's amazing. It's not obvious to almost anybody. I see the light bulb happen when I teach reflective listening, which has just been around for so long. But essentially, reflective listening is the ability to paraphrase back to someone what they've just said with your words from their point of view, your words, their point of view. So the key to this is that you don't get to insert your opinion, your perspective, your ideas, your follow-up into it, that they finish talking and they finish making their point. And then you say, it sounds like what you're saying is, or it seems to me like what you're saying is, and then you give a quick summary of what they just said in your words, but from their perspective. And the reason this is so crucial in conversations is one, it implicitly tells the person that you are completely focused on what they're saying, that you are truly present and engaged because you can't do it if you're not. 
You can't do it. You know what it sounds like when someone's not really listening to you, right? You finish making your point. You've said something that's really meaningful to you or whatever. You stop. And then you can see the person's brain registers silence. They realize you've stopped talking and they kind of, their eyes click in and they're like, yeah. And you're like, oh, this person's not listening to a word I'm saying, right? And it instantly disconnects you. It breaks everything, right? It puts a wall up. And so by doing reflective listening, you really implicitly, without saying anything really, you tell the person you're really engaged. And the second major reason that I teach this is if you're having a disagreement, a debate, an argument, it is so crucial to show the person that you've understood what they said before you counterpoint. Because the most common thing that happens in arguments and debates is that there's a misunderstanding right at the beginning. You're using the same term in different ways. You've got different uh, assumptions going in, but neither of you clarified it. And you get all the way to the end of the debate. You're heated, you're angry, and you realize you've actually been agreeing the whole darn time because you didn't check. Now, here's the thing. When you get to that moment and you realize you've been agreeing the whole time, all that negative energy, all the anger, all the all the argument, it doesn't just go away. You've got that built up now, even if you intellectually understand you've been agreeing the whole time. And like cracks in a sidewalk, they do build up and they can erode even the strongest relationships. So by doing reflective listening, it's really, really crucial. You make people feel understood, feel heard, feel valued, and you give yourself the opportunity to recognize that you don't actually understand their point. Because you might say, so what you're saying is, or what I hear you saying is blah, blah, blah. And they might go, oh no, no, that's that's not what I'm saying at all. And this is beautiful because now they have a chance to make themselves understood to go, no, 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 what I'm trying to say is, and they get to try again. And now you've reached understanding. And I say this all the time, connection is not about agreement. Connection is about understanding. You said something, I think in the book, and you were giving this example about what happens when you stop speaking and then the brain registers silence. And I think in the book, you mentioned something with regards to eye contact. I think what you said was you were speaking and then at some point your eye, your eyes look towards the person and you realize the person is not looking at you and then you, you figure out you're not being listened to. And this is something that was going through my head right now as you were speaking because we're now in this weird situation where you're speaking, if I want to look like I'm looking at you, I need to look at the camera. So I'm not looking at your face. And, and this is all very awkward. So, you know, I find it easy to look at the camera when I'm talking. I find it very strange to look at the camera while I'm listening to you. So I wanted to ask you, with all that's going on and with online having become, you know, pretty much all we have at the moment, what are some basic things that you are either doing yourself or telling people to do that help bridge that, that gap in connection over video conferences? which seems to be all we do nowadays. Th this is so, so perceptive. Like, and it, and it just, it, it just underscores the fact that you, you know, you're a professional communicator, you're a speaker. And so you think about things like this. Uh, th this is exactly what, first you said, what you're doing or what you're teaching. Everything I teach, I do. So uh, I only teach things that I do. You've noticed the entire time we've been having a conversation, it's felt like I've been looking right at you. I have been looking at, I don't even know what you look like. I've been looking at the camera the entire you, You're missing time. out, Brian. <laughs> 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 I mean, come on. I'm looking now. You have some glorious hair. It's yeah. wonderful. Oh, wonderful. This is this is lockdown hair. Yeah, yeah, but but it worked for you. My lockdown <laughs> hair, if I took out my ponytail right now, I look like I'm playing all those guitars you see in the background in 80s hair metal bands like I used to when I was younger. Listen, if you look up if you look at the <laughs> podcast after after we're done, you'll find that this is the best thing that's happened to me with the lockdown is I always had my hair super short. It grew out into this. And I had this idea of having a friend who was a great illustrator to do an illustration of me on stage with kind of a superhero theme, which is kind of my thing. And then this hair helped a lot. So <laughs> you see the cover <laughs> of the podcast is me doing like this with this hair. So, you know, go lockdown. Oh, uh, man, that's but beautiful. sorry, you were so saying, yes, you've been looking at me the whole time. Yeah. So, so this is, like I said, very perceptive. Th this is the most difficult thing to do when it comes to communication in, in the virtual world, which is 
eye contact. It is completely the inverse, not the opposite, but the inverse of the real world, which is in the real world as a listener, you want to be looking at, you want to be locked eyes with the speaker because as a speaker, we kind of, you know, we look around the room, we look up to the left, we look up to the right, we try to think about what we're saying. But like you said, once in a while, we check back in with the person we're speaking to. And in that split second, if they, the person we're speaking to is locked eyes with us in that split second, there's so much confidence in that moment. You feel like this person cares about what I'm saying. I can keep going. I'm on a roll, right? Um, and if they're not, you feel disconnected immediately. You feel unsure of yourself. Maybe they are not interested in what I'm saying. So in the virtual world, the problem is, as you noted, the screen where the person is that you want to look at and the camera where they actually are seeing you from are two different places. And so the key is as a listener, in order to make the person that we're speaking with, that's speaking with us, feel like we're locked eyes with them, we actually have to look at the camera. And if you look at the camera, if you just burn the camera while they're talking to you, you're missing out on all the cues, the visual cues that you normally pick up on when someone's talking, right? So the key to connection in the virtual world is that we need to sacrifice a little bit of our ability to pick up on those visual cues in order to make the other people feel like we're listening, like we're engaged. And so as a listener, you need to lock eyes with the lens, not the screen. It is very disorienting when you start doing it. But like any skill, you can practice it. You can get more comfortable with it. I've been doing video conferencing for years and years. I was one of those people on Zoom five years ago before the whole world discovered Zoom, you know, two months ago. Uh, so I've been doing this a long time. But at the beginning, it's very awkward. As a speaker, it's a little bit easier. You can look at the lens, but you can still look around the room. You can check the screen. You can come back. But for me, like you, if I look at the screen, like you right now, if you're looking at the camera, when I check the screen, it really feels like you're listening to me. Even though intellectually, when I see that you're looking at the screen, I know you're looking at me, but your brain just doesn't register it. It's built into us that if those eyes aren't on me, on my eyes, that they're not really looking at me. So it's, it's disorienting. I'm trying to take my eyes off of you, but you're magnetic. Uh, it's very difficult. It's, it's, it's very tough competition. Something, something that I have been thinking about with regards to video conferencing having become the new kind of the new thing, and I think it's 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 a bit of a problem as well because we are creating an obstacle sometimes where there wasn't one. So I, I fully get Zoom or whatever we're using for a group of people, but. You know, I, I was in sales for a long time and I did everything over the phone. You know, I had clients and I always spoke to them over the phone. And I don't have, I never had a problem with picking up emotional cues through someone's voice. I mean, you get trained to do it. Uh, you know, I, people would say, oh, but it's difficult to, to sell if you're not in person. No, you're just having a conversation. You have to get into the conversation. And it's something that now I think people are too focused on what the camera is showing you. And you, you forgot to pick up on people's voices, which again, wealth of, of information coming from that. It's, it's a really good point. I think people have completely forgotten about the phone as a tool in the last few months because everyone gets just got so excited about video conferencing. It, it, it was really funny to see the entire world get excited about a technology that's been around for like 20 years, um, like just discovered it, which is okay, I get it, right? Most people aren't in the world like you and I are where we need to connect with clients internationally and all this stuff. But but what's interesting is that I, I, I think that's a really good point. When you're on a video chat, you've got a computer screen or something in front of you, which means the amount of potential distractions is insane. And I think the biggest distraction is looking at yourself. I think people get distracted looking at how they look like on the screen, right? We're worried that how's my hair right now? Do I have a pimple on my face? Is that, you know, is the lighting weird? Am I the, and they just completely disconnect. Whereas on the phone, you, it's like the podcast. It's just a voice in your ear. You're having a really intimate moment with one person and you've got to focus um, because if you're not really listening, there's nothing else there, right? It's like on a video chat, if you're not really listening, at least you kind of visually see what's going on. So your brain thinks it's okay to kind of tune out a little bit, but you can't do that on the phone because there's nothing else. You, you, you're, you're, you're stuck. Um, so recently I've had 
I've had some clients that after three months of, you know, setting up Zoom calls, one of them the other day said, uh, do you want to do a Zoom? I said, no, I don't. I, I just call me. Just call me like we used to. Just call me. It's fine. We'll be in and out of the conversation in 10 minutes instead of feeling, doing this dance of visual aesthetics. And are you muted? Oh, no, you're not muted. Wait, maybe it's my mic. May, you know, this nonsense that bogs down everything. Having said that, I, I think video conferencing is a magnificent tool, especially for group calls, right? If you've ever done a group conference call, very difficult on the phone alone. You can't tell who's talking and and whatever. So a lot of good reason for that. I think video conferencing made the ability to stay in touch with friends and family, the personal side of interaction, um, really powerful um, uh, during during this really weird, you know, unpre- I'm so tired of the word unprecedented, but you know, this word, this, this, this unprecedented time, hope you're safe and well, you know, uh, I yeah, hanging in there, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of the same three things we've all been saying for three months. I have said or typed the sanitarius has kept me sane <laughs> hundreds of times hundreds <laughs> hundreds yeah yeah how you doing hanging in there <laughs> yeah, but, uh. oh, I, i'm going to i'm going to shift gears because i realize our time is coming to an end and this is you know supposedly a podcast about stories and and one thing i had on my list of questions that i tried to consult as little as possible throughout the conversation was to do with with your storytelling because i read in spite of all the magic, the best part of the TEDx for me is the story, by far. You know, Ed's story that's great and, and told incredibly well, and, and there's a lot more of that in the book. So my question to you is, is your story, how deliberate is your storytelling? Wow, what a great question. Um, that wasn't the question I was expecting, nor one I've been asked, actually. What, what so, were you so expecting? You for that. Um, I was expecting you to ask me, I was expecting you to ask me to tell one of the three or four kind of more popular stories that I tell all the time, which is, well, again, which is fine. Sure. I get why interviewers ask that because yeah. their audience hasn't heard it before. I get sure. it. But having sure. said that, um, yeah, so it's so funny. I just derailed myself. So the question was, how, oh, deliberate. how deliberate? Yes. How deliberate is the storytelling? It is meticulous. It's funny because like the day of the TEDx talk, um, which I just had the five-year anniversary of that talk just a few days ago, I Facebook memories popped up and I was like, wow, what has changed in five years? Um, that day when the conference was over, all the other speakers, eight or nine other speakers came up to me and they said, this was the day of, and they said, did you like, did you rehearse that? And I remember looking at them going, Did you not, you know, (laughs) like, yeah, I rehearsed it over 200 times over three months. I mean, like, and you're a speaker, you get that. You say that to the average person and they're like, what are you nuts? No, I just put a few bullet points the day before and went up there and I'm going to speak from the heart. This is the biggest misconception, (laughs) right? Yes. I'm I'm sorry. Your heart doesn't talk very well. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It's like, it feels, but it doesn't talk. (laughs) That's yeah, exactly. It feels, but it doesn't talk yet yeah, talk from the heart when you're having a meet a personal conversation but this is professional right i'm 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 trying i'm i'm giving a sp- i've got an audience of people in front of me potentially on youtube i'm writing a book or a blog or a speech i've got people that i'm there for this isn't just for fun right so yeah my storytelling is meticulous i've been studying it for a long time i have a philosophy degree I actually abandoned a PhD in philosophy to pursue magic as a living. So at some point I decided card tricks were, were a more effective uh, career path than than. I'm, uh, sure, I'm than sure you philosophy. could write a philosophy book about that. <laughs> the philosophy of philosophy. Um, actually, I actually have a book called that in the other room. Uh, so it, it went in philosophy. I mean, essentially philosophy is storytelling, right? Because philosophy is not science. They don't, uh, you, you can't physically empirically check your data, check the world. So they use, um, you know, logic to, you know, philosophers use logic to examine questions. And we use thought experiments, right? Thought experiments where you take a situation and you you go, okay, let me devise some insane scenario. And what would happen if I took this situation and smashed it into this insane scenario? What would logically end up? And then you do that with a bunch of insane scenarios and you start to get a sense of how you feel about this thing and make arguments about it. Well, essentially, What you learn in philosophy, what you learn in magic is the person who tells the best story wins. This is history too. I mean, this is the story. I mean, this is how history unfolds. Plato uh, supposedly said something, storytellers rule the world. Exactly. And it is is just as true now. It's true in politics. We've seen 
the best storytelling, not a good story, doesn't mean it's a good story, right? We've seen very really horrible stories over the last few years when because they were better told it's happening right now in america and i don't want to go into the politics of this i want to talk about the storytelling of it just three days ago in america and this by the time this comes out this will probably be uh, forgotten about but the hashtag hopefully, defund not, the, hopefully not forgotten about yes yeah I, I i hope you're right i i used to be more optimistic so i hope you're right but hashtag defund the police has started trending in america and the problem is that that's not what the people mean. Defund the police. What they really mean is, no, police forces are overtaxed. They've got way too many responsibilities and not enough money to accomplish that. Let's take the responsibility away from the police that for stuff they don't need to be doing. Let's take those money and resources and move it back into the communities where we can serve people better. That's what they mean. Defund the police is a bad story. That story is not going to win. The story that's going to win, unfortunately, is the story of, no, we need to make sure there's cops that can do their jobs. It's like, yeah, that's not what the argument was. But bad storytelling is a real problem. So I'll get off my soapbox there for a moment. But like, it's not just giving TEDx talks about doing magic tricks for blind people. Like this stuff matters. Like it really, really matters. So my, my storytelling is very deliberate, but anybody can do this. There's a lot of people that think nothing really interesting has happened to me. I haven't had an exciting life. I don't have stories that I could tell. Nonsense. You've just never sat down and had the courage to put your stories on paper. A lot of people are afraid to confront their own stories, to confront their own lives and to mine it for all the things. Every person is important. We started the conversation with that. And if you really sit down and look at your life and write down all the things that happened to you that were meaningful to you, I guarantee you most of those things will be meaningful to a lot of other people who've been through similar situations. So storytelling is important. Just before we sat down to record this, I recorded a little video that's going to be out on LinkedIn tomorrow, tomorrow being a day after the podcast is recorded, not the day after it's aired, uh, where... I call it the problem with superheroes and how I'm a nerd. I love them, but they help put this idea in people's heads that stories are this big thing and it's big adventures and big obstacles and not the little things in your life. You know, the problems that make you learn stuff. And that is what sto the stories we need to tell are. Of course, that the great stories, the grand stories are important and they have their place, but the ones that... I have this idea, I haven't developed this idea yet, but I have this feeling that the stories that build up our wisdom as individuals and as a society are not the big ones because we clearly learn very little from history. So it's the little ones that get, you know, brick by brick put on top of each other and that becomes the the, the common sense or the wisdom of, of our times is, is just all these little stories. I think you should keep developing that because I think that you're right. I think you're right on with that. That that point is is really well taken lately too. That we clearly don't learn from the big monumental events, the things that you learned about all your all your time in school, all the stuff in the history books. Clearly, we're repeating. Right, history repeats itself. We make the same big mistakes over and over and over again. But as individuals, we you know, like my my life hasn't been shaped by the big stories like you know like i'm i'm half jewish half my family is 100 percent jewish it sounds crazy to say but my life wasn't shaped by the holocaust it, it like it's a story i grew up with and it's a really important one and i will fight for and speak out for rights and equality and all that stuff because i grew up with that like the culture means something to me but the actual changes in my life as as a jewish or half jewish person came from seeing small instances of anti-semitism right? The one-to-one, -one, the moments, the, the, the daily stuff, the weird things people say, and you just go, wait, what? You know, those are the moments that actually matter. The giant atrocity, while it was obviously monumentally important and, inc and incredibly important to learn about, that isn't the thing that shaped my daily life. It's the little stuff that shaped my life. And it's the little stuff that means I get to choose every day how I want to show up in the world. And I choose to show up with kindness and empathy and generosity, with a recognition, Sander, like we talked about, that every person we meet has, has a life of their own that's valuable, even if I don't agree with them. I think, uh, I think we, we can finish with that. But let me just ask, um, 
where can people find you? Sure. So brianmillerspeaks.com is my main website. Um, but uh, to be honest, most people would probably want to go straight to my blog. It's humanconnection.blog. So it's really easy, humanconnection.blog. Uh, I publish weekly there. Uh, you can toss your email in, get all the cool free resources, and get a, and you'll see my podcast and everything else from, from there. So humanconnection.blog is probably the right place. Perfect. Uh, Brian, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, it, it was a very different interview than the one I had planned, which I think is a, is a plus in, in your book. <laughs> oh, I, I, I had a, I had a great time. Yeah. I, uh, I hope we gave, uh, we gave something, uh, I know we didn't really attack storytelling directly for most of it, but, uh, but honestly, everything is storytelling. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves. And until next time. <laughs> <laughs>